Good evening, friends. Thank you so much uh, for being here for the 18th annual T.B. Maston Lecture in Christian Ethics. We are so pleased that you have come this evening for uh, this important conversation uh, tonight and again continuing in the morning. T.B. Maston was a remarkable individual born at the, just before the turn of the 19th century, living to his 90th year in 1988, taught for uh, many decades at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in Fort Worth, where he distinguished himself as a biblical ethicist. Uh, in his heyday of writing in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and early 80s, he uh, produced 30 books and many articles. and. Um, helped the church, the Baptist church in particular, to translate the scripture into everyday life. Dr. Maston was a deeply humble individual, someone with a singular kind of self-discipline, someone who loved the scripture deeply and thought it had a great deal to say to our world today and spent his career translating what scripture said in terms of how we follow Christ today and how we as a church are a faithful community of Christ. In those years, he tackled uh, many difficult issues and was a consistent advocate for inclusion of all races from uh, the 1930s until the time of his death in an era when it was not always popular to hold that position, but he held it unyieldingly with gentle but firm conviction. He had a great sensitivity to those who are on the margins and was a profound advocate for justice. This lecture, lecture series is named in his honor in an effort to not only remember his heritage and learn from him, but also to follow his model of taking scripture seriously and considering how it applies to our world today and guides us in our individual walk with Christ and our work as the church. We have uh, some different groups who are guests here this evening. A uh, group right up here on these first two rows packing their pews are the young Maston scholars who have come from other Baptist universities. And I suspect there are some other people in the room who have been young Maston scholars in the past. So all of you who are or have been young Maston scholars, would you stand so that we might recognize you? Thank you very much. And we will individually uh, announce the names of these young Masson scholars who have come from other universities and present them with a certificate and a book at the end of uh, our session this evening. We also have uh, representatives, members of the Masson Foundation Board. Uh, if you're a part of that group or have been a part of that group, would you please stand that we might acknowledge your presence here. We are so uh, honored that the Maston Foundation chose some 20 years ago to establish the T.B. Maston Chair of Christian Ethics here at Hardin-Simmons University, uh, which was the catalyst for beginning these lecture series and for the retreat with young Maston scholars. We are thankful to them for their confidence in us and their ongoing support of our work. Uh, the holder of the T.B. Maston Chair of Christian Ethics is Dr. Miles Wernz, who is Associate Professor of Theology. And in a few minutes, he'll be coming to introduce our guest speaker this evening. Uh, Dr. Wernz is responsible for putting all of this together, and we are very grateful for, for your hard work. Uh, we have other members of the Logsdon faculty here. I wonder if Dr. Wernz and other faculty and staff for Logsdon, if you would please stand, that we might uh, spot who you are. And, uh, and take an advantage of meeting them if you have not uh, already. If you would, please join me in prayer, and afterwards, uh, Dr. Wurtz will come. Our gracious Lord, what a privilege to be part of this institution, part of Hardin-Simmons University and Logston School of Theology and Seminary, where you have 
called us to study and learn, some of us to invest our lives here, that this is a place very concerned about, as Dr. Maston would say, learning to walk as Jesus walked, and a place where we can have significant discussions about what are sometimes difficult issues, seeking your guidance that we might be faithful followers and a faithful church in this day. We thank you uh, for, for Dr. Carroll, for his, his devotion to you and the church, for his careful, thoughtful work and his wisdom as we think about the Bible and migration this evening. We pray that you would help us to have open minds. You would give us the gift of critical thinking and theological reflection, but most importantly, Give us the gift of the ability that we might open our souls for the movement of your spirit who would speak to us in these days. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So thank you for everyone for being here tonight for the first lecture of our annual T.B. Maston Lectures in Christian Ethics. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to publicly offer a thanks to a few people who have really helped all this come together. Uh, first to the T.B. Maston Foundation for their continued support of Christian ethics and the legacy of Dr. Maston and uh, uh, Baptist reflection upon Christian ethics. Uh, to Dr. Bob Ellis for his leadership of the, of the Logston School of Theology and its continued commitment to Christian ethics. And I'd also like to particularly thank uh, Daniel Martin, Tammy Mantooth, Laura Seaton, and all the student volunteers who are really the ones who helped all this come together. So I'm just the face. You know. From the first chapters of scripture, migration is deeply interwoven into the story of God's interaction with humanity. From the exile from the garden to the journey into the wilderness to the journeys of Paul, the people of God are constantly on the move. And so this is a central question that we as Christians need to care, considerly, uh, consider carefully and to give a good deal of reflection to. And so tonight we have with us one who has spent much of his career thinking and writing on this important topic uh, to help us see what it means that God cares for those who are far from home. Dr. Daniel Carroll Rodas is the Blanchard Professor of Old Testament at Wheaton College and Graduate School, where he's been since 2016. He is the author and editor of numerous books, articles, and book chapters. Among his numerous books include Christians at the Border, Immigration, the Church, and the Bible, Global Voices, Reading the Bible in the Majority World, Context for Amos, Prophetic Poetics in Latin American Perspective, and many, many others, some of which are for sale just outside in the uh, Dallas Theological Seminary and the University of Sheffield, where he received his doctorate in Old Testament. Prior to Wheaton, he was the Distinguished Professor of Old Testament at Denver Seminary, as well as teaching adjunctively at the El Seminario Teologico Central America in Guatemala City for 13 years, where he spent many summers growing up. He continues to provide leadership and direction for numerous ministry initiatives as a board member of the National Hispanic Christian Leadership Conference and the Hispanic Theological Initiative, among other organizations. For decades now, Dr. Carroll has been deeply involved in issues of immigration. He was growing up and ministering in Guatemala that provided the, co the catalyst for his, his work, the relevance for the biblical text for the challenges of poverty, war, and politics in these places led him to a passionate focus on Old Testament social ethics and the social sciences. Experience in, in these countries and abroad have led him to a deep appreciation for the unique contributions that ethnic minorities, women, and the global church make to the interpretation and understanding of the Old Testament. And so it is this deep set of concerns, along with a thoroughgoing discipleship of Christians in light of the witness of the scripture, that Dr. Carroll brings to bear for us tonight. So please join with me in welcoming to, uh, welcoming to Abilene and to Hardin Simmons, Dr. Daniel Carroll Rodas. Good evening. Am I on? Yeah. Good. All right. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here. Um, I met Dr. Okay. 
I'm in some kind of force field or something. Oh, okay. I met Dr. Lawrence uh, last year, wasn't it, at, at Wheaton, and uh, he came to give a lecture on immigration. And we started a conversation, and uh, here I am a year later, so thanks, I appreciate it. Uh, a very good young scholar and ethicist and theologian, so I commend. I was reading uh, his book, actually, on the plane. And so, uh, fascinating work that we were talking about earlier today. What I want to do tonight is to talk about immigration, and I've got this PowerPoint. Now, when it comes to, okay. When it comes to uh, PowerPoints and such things, uh, I am the village idiot. So um, I'm hoping this actually works tonight. Uh, if it doesn't, uh, uh, there's a reception, and we can just move uh, right to the reception. <laughs> but hopefully it'll work. And what I'd like to do uh, this evening and then tomorrow is look at the Old Testament and migration. And tonight I want to focus on Old Testament stories. And uh, I want to take a particular kind of way of, of looking at them. And to do that, because this is an ethics lecture, we have these young ethicists here on these uh, second and third row. What I want to do is, is set the table for what I'm going to try to do as I retell these stories. And then at the end, we'll try to come back and think through them. Now, the first thing, if you're not you know, into ethics, let me just uh, give you the, the layman's version. There's three classical schools of ethical thought. Uh, one way of looking at ethics is you do the right thing. You make the right choices based on certain uh, beliefs or principles, whether you think it's natural law or the law of God. But you know, the, the, the big word that you pay big money for at school is deontology. How's that for a big word? So that's one way of looking at ethics. You do the right thing. You make the right choices. The second school of thought thinks about the consequences of a decision that you make. Now, we do this all the time. So if you're going to buy a car, or if you're going to buy a house, or if you're going to do whatever kind of thing you're deciding to do, you'll try to think ahead of what could be the consequences of that choice. Maybe it's going to be a debt, and because of that debt, you've got to work something over here. So you're, you're basing your decision on the potential consequences of that choice. So that's a bit different than the first school, which is looking at you just do the right thing. But this one, you're weighing whether or not it's the right thing. Well, why don't they learn English? These immigrants. OK, you just told me you don't know any. <laughs> because they're trying. But you know, if you're a first generation, you're, you're working 24-7. Maybe you work in a couple of jobs. You don't have the energy. You're in survival mode. It's the kids, you see. They're in the schools. And it's the kids who learn the language. Yo soy bilingüe. Sin pena. Doy esta charla en español. I can do this. Any way you want. Este es el idioma de mi madre. This is the language of my mother. And there's Joseph. And then he says things like, you know, when I die, take my bones home. Egypt isn't home. Home is that place far away from which he was taken. There's something in his soul that still reverberates Israel, Canaan. And then, you know, the story tells us that Egyptians despise shepherds. And so when his family comes, Jacob, the brothers and their families, they put them in a, a part of the delta that was kind of quarantined. They wouldn't have to see them. But there's an interesting scene there as well, you see, because the narrative tells us is that Egyptians hate shepherds. But then what Joseph does, he introduces his father to Pharaoh. 
See, his father is one of those despised shepherds. He's just a poor Bedouin. What went through Joseph's mind when he presents his dad to Pharaoh? Was he embarrassed? Was he ashamed of his father? And you get that powerful engagement where you see the old man walk over to Pharaoh and he blesses him. What a powerful story. Have you ever thought of Joseph as an immigrant story? How do you read that story? Does it resonate? If it does, how? You work with Hispanic families and the kids are ashamed. They're ashamed of their parents, ashamed of their language, translating for their parents at the school meetings. You go into an Hispanic church and the parents are speaking in Spanish and the kids are speaking in English and the teenagers in the back texting something. The parents will speak to their kids in Spanish and the kids will answer in English. How's that? Living with the shame. So you will read this story and resonate with it as an immigrant in ways that the host culture may not even think of. Esas son nuestras historias. Those are our stories. Estamos en la palabra de Dios. We are in the word of God. We'll come back to the story a bit later. Now if you finish Genesis and just turn the page, you begin another story. The story begins, the first few verses of Exodus, with the people of Israel just multiplying. But it tells us that uh, there arose a Pharaoh who didn't know Joseph. But the Egyptians are scared. Do you remember why? The numbers. Right? It's an invasion. You hear the language of our media? It's a tsunami. It's the numbers. It scares us. It's natural. There we see it in ancient Egypt. But you know what happens is that we don't know, most of us, that about 15% of the Koreans in this country are undocumented. Did you know that? We have undocumented Canadians and Irishmen, Russians, but the Hispanics, oh my gosh, they're everywhere. The numbers that scare us. And so what do you do? You, you put into place a series of legal measures to control the population. It's a very natural kind of move. Very cruel in that case where they're going to kill the little boys because they're afraid that, that Israel will rise up against the Egyptian government. National security problems. But they have these midwives, these very brave women, who say the little boys. But then what you see that the Egyptians do is they've been using uh, the Israelites for labor, construction, to build their buildings and their monuments. And then they come up with a law that makes no economic sense. You know, you've got to keep the quota of the bricks. 
but we're going to make it harder for you to build the bricks. You've got to find your own straw. And if you know ancient building practices, the straw would, you know, you, you mix it with the mud because th it gives it substance, and when it dries, it's hard. Without the straw, the, the bricks collapse. But what you see is, this doesn't make any economic sense. These bricks are for Egyptian buildings. They're not for the Israelite buildings, which don't have any, really. You would think that the Egyptian government would want to have efficiency, make it actually easier to make bigger, better, faster buildings. Makes no economic sense to put all these laws into place because of the foreign presence. Do you hear the echoes into our time? We need the labor. Who's harvesting our food? Who's building our buildings? Who's doing our landscaping? <laughs> Go into a restaurant and see who's behind the doors, cleaning the dishes and bussing the tables and cooking your food and being the nannies for your kids. We need the labor. We just don't want them. The most tragic immigrant story, if we think about it, are the African Americans. They were brought here to work. We needed their labor. We just didn't want them. We go to civil war over this, actually. 13th Amendment, 14th Amendment, but then we come up with segregation. You see, we needed their labor, we just didn't want them. And the story repeats itself with every new wave that comes in. The scripture's a bit uncomfortable, isn't it? These immigrant stories. Who do you resonate with? The Egyptians? Or with the Israelite midwives? Where do you stand in that story? Come back to that. Another story, great story, Ruth. I gotta check my time. I could go on. We, we have till like 10.30, is that what? <laughs> Just kidding, I know you want the reception. <laughs> <laughs> Let me do Ruth, and then I'll do one more real fast. These are great stories, my goodness. Ruth, you know how it begins, Naomi, and her family live in Bethlehem and Judah. There's a famine in the land, and so they leave. They're looking for food. They go across the Dead Sea to Moab. And the sons marry Moabite women, Orpah and Ruth. Okay, flip it. What you see is Ruth and Orpah marry immigrants. But then Naomi's... Uh, Husband dies and the two sons die, and now she says, which is very human, you know, I just want to go home. I hear it's better now. And you, Ruth and Orpah, just you, you stay here and just start over. No, no, you know. But finally Orpah will decide to stay, but Ruth says, you know. Your people will be my people, and, and your God, my God, and I will die with you. If you read the narrative carefully, Naomi says nothing. There's no, thank you, yes, yes, we can do this. Not a word. And so they begin the trip back to Judah. And now the woman who had married an immigrant 
Ruth, now she becomes the immigrant. And they get to Bethlehem, and all the women of the town come out, and they're weeping, and they're hugging Naomi, and she says, I'm a bitter woman. God has taken away everything from me. And where did that happen? Moab. And now she has a Moabitess with her. It's an awkward scene if you read it carefully. Ruth isn't even mentioned. She's not introduced. So what was that like? Was, was Ruth kind of standing off in the corner, not knowing what to do and what to say? And the women don't even acknowledge her. Chapter 2, she's in the fields working. She has the right to do this as an immigrant. And the wife, uh, a widow of, of an Israelite. And then Boaz shows up. Who, who's that woman? And a lot of times people go, well, you know, she must have been a really good looking woman. <laughs> he points her out right away. Well, maybe. But maybe she looked different. Maybe she dressed funny. And the workers say, well, she, she's, she's the, the Moabite, and, and she's, she's with Naomi. She's been working all day, hasn't taken a break. Listen to the words. They don't even know her name. Maybe no one's even talked to her all day. They've just watched her. They can't give you her name, but they know what she's like. She's a hard worker. That sounds very immigrant, doesn't it? Boy, those immigrants, well, you know, they work 24-7, you know. They'll work seven days a week. If we need something done, you know, they'll be here on a Sunday morning. They'll work. Yeah. And he calls her over. She comes to him, and she bows down to the ground, to her face. I'm a no kriya, the pejorative term for the foreigner. She could have taken a different label. She takes the pejorative term. Was it because she felt just marginalized? Well, then. Boaz says, look, he says, uh, you've got to be careful with the men, you know. So you, you go over here and work with the women. Okay, I'll do that. And so then she gets home, and, and, and Naomi says, well, how'd it go? Well, you know, I, I met this guy called a Boaz. Oh, he's our kinsman. Oh, God be praised. Yahweh has, you know, given us his favor. And, uh, and he, he, he brought something. Oh, that's wonderful. But let me give you some advice. Uh, Naomi says to Ruth, you know, be careful with those men, you know, you got to work with the women. Oh, yeah, that's good. I'll do that. She's already been doing it. Chapter 3. She's supposed to meet Boaz at the threshing floor. And if you read the narrative again carefully, uh, Naomi says, now, you let him do all the talking. Okay. You read the narrative... And Ruth is telling Boaz what to do. This is a very resourceful immigrant, you see. Navigating her way forward in this foreign world. And then in chapter 4, Boaz marries her, and the elders of the town will praise her like some of the, the, the great women of Israel's past, and even the women, you see, say to her, you know, she, they say to, to Naomi, she loves you more than seven sons. And Naomi says, nothing. But now there's a child. His name is Obed. And they hand her the child. And they say, you know, this child, when he gets older, he'll take care of you. And Naomi takes the child. Maybe now she'll fully embrace her foreign daughter-in-law. 
Maybe now things will be better. It's the children who are the bridge. And then there's Ovid, the half-breed. Father from Judah, a mother from Moab. I'm sure he didn't have to go through what his mother went through. And from him will come ultimately King David, it tells us at the end of the book. There's a story there too, you see. I'm Ovid. I'm a half-breed. Medio chapin, medio gringo. Half Guatemala and half American. I didn't have to go through what my mother went through. I can speak English, no accent. Six foot six, gringo face, I'm good to go. <laughs> but we're out there. Where do you resonate in the story? Are you Boaz? Is there a Ruth in this room? Any other Obeds around? Where are you in that story? Last one, then I want to move to some conclusions. Isn't this good stuff? Daniel. We often just miss so many things in the story. He's taken away to Babylon before Judah falls. So from afar, he will hear about the invasion. <clears throat> He's educated, which means he probably comes from a very well-to-do family. He obviously can read and write. Very, very few people could do that at the time. So well-heeled, well-educated, probably from a family of means. And then the reports start coming in. See, Jerusalem has been taken. The walls have come down. The temple has been burned. How much family did he lose in the war? How many friends? Everything his family had is gone. They've even given him another name. What was it like? They've taken everything from him. And they've killed his family, for goodness sake. He's a thousand miles from home. And they change his name, and then they train him for the empire. They train him to serve the very empire that destroyed his country and leveled his capital city and took everything from him. Now he must serve them. What was that like? You ever read it that way? And then he says something that's very interesting. He says, you know, let us eat our own food. He's food's a cultural marker. Right? If you want to know if you're in his, I don't know about Abilene. I just arrived last night. <laughs> but in Denver or in Metro Chicago, if you want to know what ethnic you know, neighborhood you're in, look at the restaurants. You know, if you see taquerias and pupuserias and panaderias, okay, you're in the Hispanic part. Okay? Now, I always tell this story. It's a great story. It's a true story. Um, you know, when I was in Denver, I haven't done this yet in, in, in Wheaton, so I might do this if I can. But I would take students to Guatemala about every other year. And what I would tell them is this. I said, you know, in Guatemala, we eat black beans, frijol negro. 
Uh, we can do it any way you want. We can do uh, like whole bean, you know, frijol parado. We can do arroz con, you know, con frijol. We can do beans and rice. We can do bean soup. We can do, you know, frijol volteado. Where's the Guatemalan? I met him. Hombre, frijol volteado. You, know, they, you kind of mash the bean and you, and you fry it and you flip it and it looks like a meatloaf. And you slice it and you put the white goat cheese on it with a salsita. Or as they say in this country, salsa. <laughs> this actually happened to me at least twice. Do you have any salsa? What? Do you have any salsa? Yeah, we got that. So I tell all the students, you know, you know, beans do stuff. So you got to get like in training for this, <laughs> right? And I don't know what kind of restaurants you have here, so I hope one of these works. They go, oh, we got a Cadoba, we do Chipotle. Do you have those here? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> well, because you know in Guatemala, you can have it los tres tiempos. You can have beans three meals a day. You know, for me, some beans and some toast and coffee, I'm good to go for breakfast. It was always, I could just clock it. They'd fly on a Saturday night, I'd meet them at the airport by Wednesday, always on the Wednesday. Things begin to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Carol, for the love of God, can we go to McDonald's, please? And I would go, okay, um, I'll tell you what, tonight we'll do, we'll do pizza and saw meat. Pizza in a movie, All right? I'll pay. Dr. Carroll's great. So right outside the, the seminary, you know, walk out the main gate, right to the right, there's a, a, a Domino's pizza, a walk-in, not a sit-down. So I'd say, look, I want to get the pizza, you all just wait. What they didn't know, this actually has changed, which is sad, because it was a wonderful thing I, I could do then, but uh, it doesn't happen anymore. But there was this time when Guatemala may have been the only place in the world where you could get black bean pizza. <laughs> <laughs> and so I kind of come in with a stack of pizzas. <laughs> just a small one, just, just for the effect. But it's the food, you see. Why do they want McDonald's? It's the food. What is Daniel saying? You may change our names. You may take away everything that we have. But we are Jews. And he is willing, and his friends are willing to die for their faith, marked by their food. You ever read Daniel like that? There are other stories, but I need to get to my last slide. And what I want to do is just ask questions. The virtues and the stories that we just read. To begin to think about immigration in a different kind of way. Not just about right, wrong, consequences, which you have to get to. The good. What is the good in these stories? And for whom? What is the good for the Babylonian government? And the good for these young men? Well, what is the good for Boaz? The good for Ruth, the good for Naomi. And what are the virtues do we see exemplified in the stories as they try to move toward the good? Courage, long-suffering, patience, kindness, compassion, loyalty. And how can these stories, once we begin to identify the characters and identify their virtues and begin to see ourselves in their lives, how do those stories begin to shape our own moral reasoning and wisdom?
And what kind of community will be shaped by this kind of thinking about the virtues? And what kind of practices do we need in our churches to begin to nurture a people of patience, a people of kindness, a people of empathy, a people of long-suffering, a people of justice? Read these stories with the lens of the virtues. And maybe the whole conversation about immigration begins to change. Immigrant stories all over the place in the Old Testament and the New. The Bible's full of it. We are created to multiply and to fill the earth. How do we fill the earth? Because we move. The history of humanity is the history of migration. We were just in another episode now. How does the church respond, especially when so many of those immigrants who come now are our brothers and sisters in the Lord? How do we become a people of virtue to grapple with this in ways that our politics cannot understand? to be the right kind of people in the name of the gospel. Tomorrow, what we're going to do in chapel is look at Old Testament law. Can Old Testament law teach us some things about immigration? Rich discussions, aren't they? Isn't the Bible awesome? <laughs> it is. I want to thank you for your patience, and now I turn it over to I don't know who. Do I pray or do I dance? What do you? <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Carol Rodas, for telling stories, old stories that turn out to be new stories that hold up a mirror to our culture and to our church. And in the mirror, we see the immigrant in a fresh way. And in the mirror, we are asked to imagine the way that God sees the immigrant. We are so honored that uh, these uh, young women and men are here they have been selected by their universities, by their deans, by their faculty as outstanding students who particularly have an interest in ethics. And so they have come to our campus as young Maston scholars. And their being here represents a future that God is imagining and creating within them. We want to introduce them to you individually, and Dr. Wernz will present them with a certificate suitable for framing and uh, with a book. And by the way, we have another book for you, uh, another book by Dr. Maston that we'll give to you tomorrow at lunch. The book you are presented is Biblical Ethics, his, uh, Dr. Maston's classic work. So as I call your name, if you'll please uh, come up and we'll We'll uh, present you to the group and present some things to you, and then we'll hold our applause for all uh, when we have finished. First, from the Baptist University of the Americas, we have Marduchi Estenville. And uh, secondly, uh, also from Baptist University of the Americas, Dominique Lopez. And two from uh, Dallas Baptist University, Jacob Abels. And Jordan Quicker. 
from East Texas Baptist University, Connor Guthrie, and James Ash. Two from Hardin Simmons University who get the award for coming the shortest distance today, Madison Bobbles and Carlo Serna. Two from Houston Baptist University, Beth Zimmerman and Cadence Tripp. Two from Howard Payne University, Jordan Pittman and Cecily McElwain. Two from the University of Mary Hardin Baylor, Merrick Reyes and Ashley Gregory. And two from Wayland Baptist University, Anita Salazar and Eric Dexter II. Would you express your appreciation for them? <laughs> the church will be in their hands, and we see in them such great promise and such great possibility. When we uh, finish this evening, we'll have a photograph here at the front, so we'll ask you, you who are young Mastin scholars to uh, uh, come up for that photograph as we finish. Let me give you a little reminder of uh, what's to come. As already mentioned several times by our speaker, there's a reception tonight. Um, when we finish, just across the hallway in the reception room are a few goodies. And if you can't tell, Dr. Carol Rodas is a people person. He loves to meet people and talk with people, so it'll be a great opportunity for some personal conversation with him. You'll notice there's some artwork in the reception room and in the foyer done by Hardin Simmons University art students in recognition of the International Day of Women, which is this next Thursday and is being celebrated on our campus. Tomorrow morning, the second lecture is at 9.30, not here, but in Barron's Auditorium, the large auditorium. And then for Young Maston Scholars at 10.30 in the reception room, you'll have an, an hour to have conversation with uh, Dr. Carol Rodas. And then we will have lunch, and all of us have dialogue with our speaker in the Johnson Building Multipurpose Room. So all of you who are normally a part of our weekly Thursday Logston Community Luncheons, we have a place for you, for young Maston scholars, for alumni, for the Maston Foundation. And because it's Texas, we ordered extra food. So anybody who's hungry, come on. I bet, uh, I bet we'll have enough for, for you. And uh, we'll have some good conversation, some unpacking and discussing of what all of this means. It has been a good day. And for our good word, our benediction, Dr. Larry Baker will come, someone who is uh, experienced in ethics, someone who comes along trained in the Maston tradition, our director of the Doctor of Ministry program, and, uh, and a good friend. Dr. Baker, please. Now let's stand for prayer. Now let's pray. God of the prophets, through whom you comfort the troubled and trouble the comforted, let us feel the troubling presence of your prophets in our midst. Give us the vision to recognize them, the courage to hear them, and the will to heed them. And may we go from this place tonight in the name of God, the Creator, whose strength empowers us to do his work in our world. May we go in the name of Christ, the Redeemer, 
whose love transforms us and uses us to love our world and its people as he loves us. May we go in the name of the Holy Spirit, whose presence guides us into the paths of justice and mercy, love and need. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.